All right, good afternoon and welcome to this very special event at Vandercook College of Music. My name is Bonnie Campbell and I'm the clarinet professor here. And it is a real joy to look out on Zoom and see some familiar faces and names and some new faces as well. So welcome one and all. Thanks so much for, for joining with us. I just, um, before I introduce our very special uh, guest clinician today, I wanted to mention a couple of procedural things about the class. We wholeheartedly invite you to keep your video on for the entirety of the time. I think this really allows everybody to be more engaged and get as much as possible from our time together. So thanks for being open to doing that. Also, if you would like to ask questions along the way, feel free to write them in the chat and we'll try to address as many as possible. So I am really thrilled today that we have with us one of the giants of the clarinet world, Mr. Larry Guy. I've long been an admirer of Larry and have used his wonderful textbooks. And in, in fact, I have a whole big stack <laughs> of them uh, right here. Um, and I believe uh, he's up to uh, eight wonderful books now. Is that, that the, the number? I believe so. Um, and he's uh, also produced um, wonderful educational uh, CDs that have come out on the Boston label. Um, and they showcase the artistry of clarinet virtuosos of the past. Um, uh, there's one about Daniel Bernard, Ralph McLean, Mitchell Lurie, and Rosario Mazzeo. Um, so we have Larry to thank for uh, helping us to keep their incredible legacy uh, alive. Um, Larry has done so many other things. I could definitely take up the whole time uh, outlining them, and I know you want to hear from him, uh, but I do want to highlight a couple of, of other things. Um, in addition to serving as a clarinetist in the Atlanta Symphony, um, he's performed with all major New York groups, including New York Philharmonic, the City Ballet, City Opera, New Jersey Symphony, Brooklyn Philharmonic, Orpheus, Long Island Philharmonic, Joffrey Ballet, Queen Symphony, Lake George Opera, and also performed for uh, many Broadway shows. Wow. Um, and for many years, Larry taught uh, clarinet and chamber music at Vassar College and uh, New York University as well as in the pre-college divisions of the Juilliard School and the Manhattan School of Music. And he has presented many master classes uh, literally around the world, including Curtis, Tanglewood, Northwestern, and various clarinet festivals as well. And he was for three years the International Clarinet Association's Chair of Pedagogy. And um, I know that you will really enjoy what he has to share with us. Um, he plans to highlight, spotlight uh, clarinet fundamentals today. And just before I pass things over to, to him, I do want to say just a quick word uh, to those of you who may be new to Vandercook. Vandercook College of Music has been in existence since 1909 and is the only college in the country that's solely devoted to training music educators. And our mission, our, our sole mission, is to develop uniquely skilled music teachers, whether band directors or choir directors, orchestra directors, general music teachers, develop them to the highest level. So if you are that student who um, best part of the day is making music on your instrument or your voice, um, we encourage you to think about a career in music education, and we hope that you'll come and check us out and, and visit us. We have ways to do that safely at this point in time, and um, we would love to have you come by and visit. And I believe our uh, director of admissions um, has written a note in the chat here, so you can also reach out to her. Um, so... Without any further ado, I want to turn things over to Mr. Larry Guy, clarinet virtuoso and teacher par excellence, who's positively influenced so many people. Um, so 
Um, thank you, and let's welcome him. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I'm really happy to be here and speak with you today. Um, and thanks for inviting me um, to talk about teaching and learning the fundamentals <clears throat> of clarinet playing. Now, is there a way on my iPad that I can just see everybody? Do I go to the left and make some kind of adjustment? Because I really like to see other people who are here today. Can we yeah, do there's that? There's a place where um, you can uh, go to gallery view. Um, oh, there it is. Great. Okay, nice to see you all. Um, <clears throat> um, if any of you would like to record this talk on your phones or some other device, please feel free to do so. And hopefully we'll have around 10 minutes at the end from, at, of my talk for questions. So you can be thinking of what you might want to ask me. Um, I use the term fundamental, not in the sense of elementary, which we would apply to beginning players, but rather in the sense of fundamental principles um, that the best players review and polish every day in the form of warm-up exercises. <clears throat> this is how professionals continue to improve throughout their careers. The first idea that influences my teaching is the realization that we can't see ourselves play because we have our eyes on the music or we're playing from memory, perhaps we're looking at the audience. Um, so we can't observe the four major areas of playing, our breathing mechanism, our lips, our tongue, or our fingers while we play. <clears throat> This separates us from string players and pianists who can see themselves while they're playing if they want to. And since we can't observe any of those muscle groups, we have to develop our sense of feel in order to monitor how we are producing the sound. However, with the aid of a mirror and some other tools, we can externalize many of these internal workings of our muscles. And if we can see them while we practice, that becomes a tremendous learning tool to help us develop the correct feel while we're performing. <clears throat> the second concept I use in teaching is the fact that most people's bodies are not perfectly formed to be clarinet players. And so we all have to alter some of the fundamental concepts a bit to make them work for us. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So fun four different parts work together to play the clarinet, the airstream, the embouchure, the tongue, and the fingers. I believe that one of the best ways to improve is by isolating each of these parts, working with each one separately or sometimes two parts together, and then putting all four parts together again to play music. Let's start with the airstream because it is the most important ingredient in playing any wind instrument. Earlier, I mentioned that when we play, we are blind to the four aspects of playing, and there's nothing more invisible than air so to develop the way we use the air, we need some tools and methods to help us. Um, what we develop are the muscles that control the air and create air intensity, including the abdominals, the side and the back muscles right around the waistline. I think the term air support is a very good term because when it is working well, we feel that not only is the air supported, but other parts of the body are also supported and so we can relax our shoulders, the chest, the neck and the arms, and the fingers. They can all relax if the air is supported well. It should feel a little like sitting on a well-inflated inner tube while floating in a swimming pool. To play well, we need to produce a very narrow, focused, fast-moving airstream. A lot of teachers ask their students to blow more air as they play, but I prefer to ask them to use more air intensity. And here's how we get that air intensity. The mirror helps us as it does in so many other aspects of playing. And the first thing we need to do is to take a deep, low breath. After I show you how to do it, we will do this exercise, exercise together. Some of, them, of you may remember this with some of your other teachers, but here's the way I do it. First of all, you flatten your hand um, and then you put your thumb under your chin. And then you open your mouth into an O shape and um, you bring the hand to your lips and you take a quick, deep, noisy breath, <sighs> something like that. You wanna try one? Let's all try one of those. <sighs> now, when this happens, the muscles around your waist have expanded, the abdominals, the side and the back muscles. And this is a very quick, low breath. 
I'd like to do one more and focus on the expansion around the waist. So we'll do exactly what we did before, but really um, observe how your um, abdominals and side and back muscles expand. Here's your flat hand, your chin under your, or your uh, thumb under your chin, open up and. Okay, now we're gonna add something to that. Um, and the next step we do, uh, is this is cumulative, so we'll start the way we did before we add another thing to it. This time we're gonna take the same kind of breath, but before we exhale, we're gonna turn our hand and we're going to blow into the palm of our hand about six inches away from the, from the face. And when we blow in, we wanna make the most air, uh, intense air stream that we possibly can. And that intensity is going to be controlled, manufactured really by the muscles of uh, around the waistline. So here we go again, flat hand, thumb under the chin, take a deep breath. Now turn the hand, blow into the hand. See if you can make that airstream about 900 miles an hour. It should feel like little needles in this, in, going into the center of your palm. This feeling is what we have to memorize. The feel of the work of these muscles around the waistline, because it is the gauge by which we know how focused and fast the airstream is. Since we can't really feel air, this is air support, and this air support has to be constant throughout our plane. Now, we're going to take one more breath as we did, and we're going to add one more thing. We take the breath, we blow the air into our palm, and now I want you to move around your um, shoulders, your chest, your neck, your upper body, and make that as relaxed as you possibly can while you're continuing to use the, the abdominal muscles to make that very intense air stream. Okay, so here we go. Here's your hand. Take your breath. <laughs> Blow into your palm. Now move a bit. As relaxed as you can in your upper body. Uh, we do this exercise to separate the use of the muscles. The ab side and back muscles at the bottom of our torso are working steadily to create an intense airstream, but the muscles above our solar plexus, and the solar plexus is right there, above our solar plexus stay relaxed and flexible. This is one of our most important coordinations. If we don't develop it, we might in, end up tightening up the shoulders, neck, and arms as we take the breath, and those tight muscles will constrict our air rather than relax and enhance the intensity of it. The coordination that we're working on is similar to a sort of an eye-catching advertising device I sometimes see. It's a nylon tube with a face painted on it and arms coming out the sides. And it looks like, can you all see it? There, it looks like that. <laughs> Do you see these? It has an air compressor unit at the bottom and it has this tube and this one is a car wash and it moves around like this, okay? Now I actually have one of these, there's one in Albuquerque near my home. And so I've actually made a little video of it. Here it is. Can you see it? There it goes. There's the video of what I'm talking about. Now that's the air compressor unit doing all the work and everything above the, the unit is as relaxed and flexible as possible. Um, now we aren't gonna necessarily move around that much when we play, but we should feel as, we, as if we could if we wanted to. Now, one of our great tools for developing the air is called a breath builder. Have you all seen these? Do you know what that is? Now, um, I strongly urge you all to get one if you don't have one al already. Uh, most of the online music supply stores carry them. Um, and I'll give you a very short tutorial. Um, the goal here um, is to keep the ping pong ball up while you're blowing out. So it comes with two tubes, but I'm gonna use the narrow tube right now and just do a very quick little demo. We take our breath. Can you see the ball? I'll try to get this so you can kind of see the device. Here we go. I take a breath. Okay. 
So whether I'm breathing in or out, the ball stays up. Um, and then what happens is you put the metronome on, on at 60 and gradually you uh, count the numbers of beats that you can blow out and you try gradually to increase that number. Very frequently you'll get a number like, oh, let's say six. Say it's six uh, beats out and that will stay for weeks and it's very frustrating. And all of a sudden you go to nine, it's incredible. But sometimes the, um, the improvement is not exactly on a straight plane, but it stays, it stays at one level and then goes up. The other thing you can do on the breath builder, there are actually many things, and I've um, outlined that in my embouchure book. But another thing that's really great is you can articulate with it. And that shows you what your air is like behind your tongue. So you take another uh, breath like I did. And as I'm articulating, um, the, the ball will get very turbulent, but it won't drop. And very frequently when students first start to use this, the ball does drop when they start to articulate. And that tells us something very, very important that, and that is when you go from slurs to articulation, you increase that airspeed a little bit. So those, uh, it has many great things for us. So I really recommend you get it. Um, another um, thing that we can use as a, as a tool for air column is drinking straws. I use two drinking straws. I crimp the end of one and put them together like this. Now, the drinking straw does something very important for us. First of all, the shape of it uh, tells us that we're actually not going to be filling up the bore of the clarinet with air, but we shoot the air through the, the center of the bore. We're shooting the air in a very, very narrow column to the center of the bore through the bell. Um, and so that's one great thing that tells us. The other thing it tells us is that we need to separate our awareness of the air from the fingers. And when you have a little uh, plastic clarinet, I call it, a little plastic clarinet like this that you practice with, you can practice on a challenging technical thing. Um, so you don't get much sound, but you, you play it and you can finger it just like you do the clarinet. You play through the uh, challenging technical passage and um, you keep the air absolutely steady all the way through. Sometimes your teacher can put his or her hand on the other end of the tube and feel that, that pressure, that air pressure all the way through. Um, it helps us very much because oftentimes if we have a challenging technical passage, we think, oh, the fingers aren't doing quite as good a job as they should. But oftentimes it's also the air that's not quite as steady because we're thinking about the fingers. So we have to separate them and make sure the air pressure is good all the way through. Other teachers like this very, very small uh, coffee stirrer. It's the same idea, but it's an even smaller bore. And when you blow through it, you need to blow very, very intensely. And so it's a very good thing to do and also you can finger with it as if it were a clarinet. So it, you can really do a lot of things with it. Uh, let's see. Um, this brings us to another concept that is almost exactly what I've talked about, but not quite. And that is the concept of blowing through the bell of the clarinet um, all the time. The air speed needs to be constant and steady through the um, through the bell. So we're not directing the air just to the reed or just to the mouthpiece, but past the reed and mouthpiece all the way through the clarinet, through the bell. Um, this is an especially good concept for young students. Let's say ages 10 to 14, because it really gets the air moving, even if they're not quite ready for an in-depth study of the support muscles. Once learned, I remind my students about this all the time, always be blowing through the bell. And the next thing we're gonna work on is the embouchure. Uh, embouchure is a French term that simply means mouth position. Uh, we study it in two parts, the external embouchure, which is your lips, and the internal embouchure, which is your tongue and throat. Uh, let's start with the external embouchure because it's the easiest to observe in a mirror. We de develop the embouchure away from the clarinet and we use the mirror every day to do it. When a student comes to me to take a first lesson, I, I ask him or her to make their embouchure away from the clarinet. 
And this is something that I usually see. It looks very similar to this. Okay. Now there's some very good things about it, but there's a, something else that we need to study. First of all, most students, when they come to me, know about a long flat chin, which you can see in profile. And most of them have a lower lip that is well stretched against the teeth, also very good. But what I see is that the lips form a huge hole to accommodate the mouthpiece. And this is what we want to refine a bit. In addition to keeping the long chin and the stretched lower lip, we will make a very small hole in the center of the lips, similar to what we did when we were working with the air earlier today. Then while blowing strongly through it, we will keep our lips hugging the teeth all the way back to the molars. So the lips are constantly resisting the air pressure. This is the way we build the muscles of the external embouchure away from the clarinet. We could do it together. You first of all, you make a long flat chin, you stretch the lower lip against the teeth. Now take a deep breath. And as you exhale, be sure the lips are not puffing out, but rather hugging the teeth and you're exhaling through a tiny little hole. Great, that's the idea. Um, this is an important exercise because when you start to play, there are so many other things to do to get the right notes, the rhythms, the articulation, so the details of the embouchure can get lost or forgotten. But if you build the embouchure away from the clarinet in front of a mirror, then you're making a good habit of how to shape the lips and how they should feel. Also, you're strengthening the lips, which is another important ingredient to a good embouchure. So I asked my students to make their embouchures in front of a mirror. In fact, we do it together and we're looking for a very specific shape. Most of us, regardless of what our faces look like, will form a similar look, uh, lip shape, kind of looks like that. And then we blow the air strongly through the small hole in the center of the lips. Um, um, by using the lips in this way, you're also understanding more about what the, what the air needs to do, namely, to focus and to move very fast. The next step also done in front of a mirror is sliding the mouthpiece against the stretched lower lip and into the mouth. This step is important. So you turn your shoulder towards the mirror so you can see your face and profile. And as the mouthpiece and reed get close to the lower lip, often the lower lip will soften. This is an old habit we've developed as children because when we bring food into the mouth, we soften our lips in order to chew our food. So we have to make sure that when we bring the reed and the mouthpiece close to our lower lip, we're not softening anything. Um, so that lower lip stays firm and well stretched. So then we slide again and we can then finish up the embouchure and let's just play a couple of open Gs, okay? It creates a relationship between the lower lip and the reed. That relationship is a sliding relationship. It's not a direct pressure relationship into it. So it's not going in perpendicularly, but it's a sliding relationship. Um, once the mouthpiece is in the mouth, you can just do that G. Always make sure you're firm here before you slide in. Now, although this may seem to be what you do in the first lesson, I review, review this sequence many times, even after the student has become more proficient, because I think it is so tremendously important. To quote one of my teachers, we are forming the embouchure completely before we play a note. The lips should feel like a rubber band exerting steady pressure all around the mouthpiece like so, not just to the reed, but all the, around the mouthpiece. And all of the embouchure exercises we just did can be worked on with the youngest students ages 10 to 14. This development of lip strength takes time because lips are not naturally very strong. Uh, I wanna make sure that I'm still being able to see everybody here. There we go. There you are. For a moment, I just had myself and I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of looking at myself. Um, 
the lips are not naturally very strong. They're designed to move fast so we can talk quickly or chew food quickly or make facial expressions. But we are asking the lips to exert a steady pressure over long periods of time. And this is not what they naturally do. By developing the strength of the lips, we are gradually transitioning into less jaw pressure on the reed and more lip pressure. But discerning between lip muscles and jaw muscles can be confusing since they're so close together. Um, so I have an exercise to help students feel the difference between them. If you have a pen or a pencil handy, you can do this exercise with me. First of all, you hold the pen in the mouth with the teeth only. So you pull the lips away and you hold it like that, okay? That's using your jaw pressure. Now, you're gonna cover both lips with your teeth but keep the lips very soft and still hold the pen with the jaw muscles. Okay. Now do it one more time, just like that. But this time open up the jaw. If you open up the jaw, the, the pen has to be held with your lip muscles. Okay. So here's the final thing. Start with the lips, lips soft, put the pen in. Now open off your jaw. And now you can feel the lip pressure holding your pen. And that's the kind of lip pressure you need for clarinet. Whether you're playing single lip or, or double lip, it's still the same kind of idea. One other thing you noticed, when you opened up the jaw, the throat also opened up. That's a very good thing. After the student has developed more lip strength, I often ask him or her to take in a little bit more reed, which we do by pushing up with the right hand thumb. This way we don't alter the embouchure as we take in more reed. If a student is playing too much on the tip of the reed, um, by pushing up with the right hand thumb, one hears more of the vibrancy of the reed immediately, although the player may not be blowing harder. I'll give you a little example. I'm gonna be playing with really soft lips on the tip of the reed. Not much to it, okay? But now if I push up with my right hand thumb, get my lip a little farther down and I have a larger vibrating surface to go, to vibrate, I don't have to blow harder. So here's step one again. I'm on the tip. That's just by pushing up with the right hand thumb. I'm not blowing harder, but I have more vibrant reed at my disposal. So it makes a, a dramatic change in sound. Although the external embouchure can be taught to the youngest players aged 10 to 14, I usually wait until the student is a little older or more advanced to teach the internal embouchure, say 14 or 15, but of course there are exceptions. The internal embouchure is about the position of the tongue and the relaxation of the throat. If these two areas are working well, Coupled with a good sense uh, use of the lips, the player, even a very young student, has a good chance of producing a beautiful sound. To get an idea of the ideal position of the tongue, <clears throat> make a strong high-pitched hissing sound like this. <laughs> so you're all gonna hiss like a cat. <laughs> okay, now open up your mouth in front of a mirror and you'll see the posi tongue position that created that hiss. The middle of the tongue is touching the upper molars. This tongue position narrows the airstream and speeds it up. If you can carry, <clears throat> if you can make that hiss, sorry. If you can make that hiss while playing the clarinet, you will have a tongue position that will help your sound, articulation, and intonation. If you can't quite get the middle of the tongue to touch the molars while you're playing, get as close as you can. And this is one place where we may have to adjust the fundamental concept, concepts a little bit to accommodate the differences in the shape of your mouth and your tongue. The tongue should stay in nearly the same position all the time when you play. <clears throat> and the challenge to that is that the tongue is by nature a restless muscle. It tends to move all over the mouth if it's not trained. <clears throat> your goal will be to keep it in that high poised hissing position all the time. I tell my students to imagine a, a little tiny camera inside their mouths with the lens pointed back into their mouth. They can make a movie of the inside of their mouths while they play, 
but it will be a terribly boring movie because not much happens. The tongue stays in nearly the same position all the time. And if you want to articulate, the front of it just does that a little bit. So it's in the most boring movie in the world. For a beautiful sound, always keep the front half inch of the tongue as close to the reed as possible. And then when you articulate, the tip of the tongue will move a very short distance up to the reed and back. So it's just very close and it just makes that tiny little motion. One important detail, we keep the middle of the tongue high in the mouth as in that high pitched hiss we've just done. Be sure not to raise the back of the tongue too high in the throat. This will result in a nasal buzz because the valve at the back of the mouth has been closed and the air does not go through the mouth, but actually goes through the nose. If you ever hear the sound in your plane or your student's plane, you will know that you're raising the back of the tongue too high. It's pretty easy to fix so long as you know how to do it. So you can move from one to the other by moving the tongue back and forth. And it starts, if you get the nasal buzz, it sounds something like this. Can you hear that? Okay. Now, if I then move my tongue forward, so the high point is in the middle of the tongue, that's how, that's how it happens. And it's very easy to fix, but unfortunately I hear it quite frequently and it's just because people misunderstood and got in the back of the tongue too high. Thinking of a yawn right before you make your embouchure will help keep the throat relaxed and the back of the tongue lower in the mouth and it will vo avoid any chance of getting that nasal buzz. So the internal embouchure should be in the shape of a funnel. <clears throat> the front of the mouth corresponds to the narrow end of the funnel and uh, the back of the mouth is the wide part. The tongue forms a nice poised arch inside the funnel like so. And uh, the air travels over the top of the tongue. Now, using the tongue for articulation. The tongue is one of the most powerful muscles in the body and it also has a very well-developed sense of touch. In clarinet playing, we emphasize its sense of touch and de-emphasize its power. So we never think of the muscularity of the tongue, but always strive to relax it. An old fundamental concept that you may have all heard is that you uh, use the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. This is two directives, and I think one of them is a lot more important than the other. The first directive is to use the tip of the tongue. Now, I think this is a great directive because it helps us achieve clarity and variety in our articulation, just as we do when we speak. We use the tip of the tongue frequently when we talk. The second directive to touch the tip of the reed is not so easy for all players. It depends upon the length of the tongue and the length of the jaw, and these vary widely from person to person. If you have a re relatively short tongue and if you have a long jaw, touching the tip of the reed may be an easy thing to do. However, if you have a short jaw and a long tongue, you will naturally tongue the reed a little farther down and there's nothing wrong with that. You can easily find where the optimum touch spot is. You simply tongue some open G's, place the tongue back on the reed, Take the mouthpiece out of the mouth. You're on the honor system here. You can't move the tongue. <laughs> and then look in the mirror and see exactly where that spot is. So if you play your G's. And then you just turn a little bit and you can see exactly where that spot is. In fact, you can then take your finger and find exactly that spot on your, on your, on your reed. Now you have a good idea for the best spot for your tongue to touch the reed. Um, it should be a comfortable spot. And note also that when you take the mouthpiece out of the mouth, you're touching the reed with the tip of the tongue, not a larger area of tongue. Your goal when tonguing notes all over the range is to keep touching that same spot on the reed, no matter how long or short the articulation is, unless you want a very special effect for some reason. Um, if your tongue is relaxed, it will feel that spot easily and can tell you if you're moving away from it. As we mentioned before, when you articulate, it's the first front half inch of the tongue that will move up and down to the reed. You can see this uh, motion. It's a very natural motion and you can see it in the mirror. You start with that hiss that we talked about before and you do that in front of a mirror. Now you phonate the hiss 
into he. So you say he in front of the mirror and then turn the he into t. T, 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 t. Now, if you open up your mouth a little bit, you see the exact motion of your tongue in the front of your mouth. It moves up and down and it touches your hard palate right behind your front teeth. And then it moves down just a tiny little bit. That is the natural motion of the tongue. It's also up and down is much faster than back and forth. So it's up and down that we want to use for speed. Um, let's see here. Oh, yes. Now, um, we strive to have the clarinet tone be as beautiful and full when we articulate it as it is when we're slurring. If we hear, hear extra noise in the articulation, it is usually caused by one of two things. First, there may be too much mass of tongue on the reed. To make sure that you're not using too much tongue on the reed, sometimes we have to review exactly where the tip of the tongue is. And a coffee cup lid, we've all seen these, right? A coffee cup lid will help us do that. Here's the way it works. We do a little uh, routine with it. You make an embouchure and then you bring the lid to your face and you put your tongue through that little hole slowly five times. Mm -hmm. And feel the sharp edge of the hole. Now your next step is going to be putting your, another finger on the other side of the hole. So on the inside of the coffee cup lid, you put a finger. That's going to be your surrogate reed. And the tip of your tongue is going to go through that hole and touch your reed. Okay, so you do that sl slowly five times. Uh, <laughs> so your tongue can feel touching the reed and your reed, which is, is your finger, can feel the tongue coming to touch it. <clears throat> now, the next thing you do is you put the lid down and you um, put your finger outside of your mouth and you brace your hand on your chin. And if you're in front of a mirror, you can see very closely, very clearly, that tip of the tongue coming to touch the finger. This is a great exercise because not only are you feeling exactly where the tip of the tongue is, but you're seeing it. And everything that you see reinforces your muscular, mu muscular use. Now, <clears throat> the second reason for noise in the articulation is that the throat may be closing off. You can hear this change with your voice between speaking with a relaxed throat like this or closing the throat off like that. And so you can actually hear that kind of sound get into articulation. It's a noisy change in sound. The problem is common and can be alleviated by having the tongue yawn before starting the tonguing exercise. Feeling that relaxed open throat and then keeping that feeling when playing the exercise. This reinforces the idea of the funnel shape we talked about, <clears throat> uh, that funnel shape that we discussed earlier. Just make sure that the throat stays relaxed and is not forced too far open. Many students come to me hoping to improve the speed of their tongue. And, but I usually start the way we just talked about today by working on the purity of sound of your articulation. If we can achieve a really good sound to the articulation, oftentimes the speed has also improved, sometimes dramatically, because speed is often the result of efficient use of the tongue and air together, with the emphasis on air speed behind the tongue. If the air is strong and fast, then the tongue can relax, and as one teacher told me, it can flap in the breeze. To study the fingers, we first designate first joint, second joint, knuckle. And there are three great finger fundamentals that I think work for just about everybody. <clears throat> first, the middle of the palms should stay relaxed and open um, with a comfortable valley in the center of the palm. You can feel this part of your hand with a thumb of your other hand. You just lightly press in and you can feel that. This idea came from a teacher of mine named Anthony Giuliotti, who was principal clarinet of the Philadelphia Orchestra for 47 years, and who <laughs> played thousands of cadenzas and solos, and I don't think he ever missed. <laughs> he had great fingers, but it's this um, relaxed palm that really helps. Um, <clears throat> now, once this palm is relaxed, 
the fingers can be thrown from the knuckle. And it relaxes not only the hand, but it relaxes the fingers as well. Second, the fingers should lift and drop directly over the keys without any additional sideways motion. So we avoid that kind of lateral motion and instead work on lifting and dropping directly over the keys and tone holes. There may be um, a, um, um, an exception now and then. For example, if I'm playing low B flat, can you see it? Yeah. If I'm playing low B flat, E flat, D flat. I have to move laterally the first finger of my right hand. But we try to avoid that lateral motion as much as possible. <clears throat> of course, some players will curve their fingers more than others, depending upon the length of their fingers. But avoid pulling the fingers back away from the keys, which will necessitate pushing them back into place before dropping them, thereby losing time. Um, so to keep the, the motion of the fingers simple and efficient, we have an, a good exercise called the C to O exercise. So we can all do this. You just put the tips of your thumbs together, like so. And then your, your hands will, fingers will form a nice C, okay? Now you're gonna bring one finger, let's say the first finger of both hands down to make a perfect O. Now you can do the second finger, third finger, fourth finger. And the thing that's really great about it is you're keeping the fingers in the same kind of sh uh, shape, a nice curved shape, and you're dropping them from the knuckle. So we're not moving the fingers this way, but keeping them curved and dropping from the knuckle. Um, the finger lift takes more energy than the drop. The drop is aided by gravity. So to keep the finger lift, uh, we want to keep the finger lift as lively and energetic as possible. Um, the goal is to have the fingers lift and drop at the same speed, especially for technical passages. But to do this, it will feel as if the lift has to be a tiny bit faster than the drop. The third um, fundamental about fingers is to move them from the knuckles, which you mentioned a little bit before. The fingers themselves move as little as possible and the wrists stay as quiet as possible, especially that left wrist. Now, if your left wrist wants to go over to Mars and Venus every time you open, play an open G, um, you can lightly touch the E, B key with your little finger. That is a great anchor for your left hand. And at first it feels like you're stretching out your left hand quite a lot, but actually once you get used to it, it's just fantastic for keeping the hand there. <clears throat> um, one of the most common problems with fingers is over muscularization. The player is using more muscular tension or tenseness than needed. So the fingers are slamming or grabbing too much. This usually results in less accuracy, although the player is working very hard. Here we think creatively. Imagine the fingers to be made out of marshmallows or spaghetti or are not having any bones. However, one important point, we're rarely successful with just softening up something. Usually uh, if we lighten up one area of our plane, something else will have to work harder to maintain our equilibrium of work. So if you lighten up the hands and fingers, then increase the work of the support muscles. Um, we can't work on the fingers without also training the eyes because they work together. Training the eyes to look ahead is of utmost importance. This develops hand-eye coordination. So you are continually planning how, you're, uh, how you will be playing the notes coming up. We call this hearing with our eyes. But looking ahead is also a great way of planning how your fingers will move as easily and relaxed as possible. Scales are a good way of developing the most efficient finger motion because after we have learned the scale, our daily practice of them has nothing to do with learning notes and everything to do with improving the finger motion by looking ahead. Um, by now, I think you've gotten the idea that I work over and over with two things, details and sequences. I get very specific about details and I insist on a specific order of doing things, a sequence, because I think this is the best way to form good muscle habits. 
students' brains understand fundamentals very quickly and because after all, most of them are pretty simple ideas. However, muscles are much slower and must be reminded over and over. The sequences tell the muscles what to do in no uncertain terms. And if you let up on their training, muscles can be relied upon to create bad habits in no time. So we have to be diligent in training our muscles carefully. And I think the reiteration of details and sequences brings the best results. Um, and the best way of incorporating details and sequences is through warm-up exercises at the beginning of the practice sessions. Um, because that way you get very specific about each muscle group. Um, here are a couple of ideas of, of exercises I use as warm-ups. For air and embouchure, um, I love long tone exercises. And I know your teacher will have favorites for you. Um, and I have written down two that I think are really excellent um, um, that I do use as warm ups in my embouchure book. Uh, for tongue and air, um, the coordination between tongue and air is very important. And I do a short note exercise from Cal Opperman. Cal was a great teacher of mechanics. He called these first note exercises. And they'll be done, they'll done, done at the beginning of the practice session and you keep blowing between the notes when your fingers on that or when your tongue is on the reed. So I'll start an E major and it just sounds like. <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, and notice that if I surprise myself and pull the instrument out of my mouth between notes, I'm blowing. And the only reason I didn't get a sound when I was playing between the notes is because my tongue was on the reed, but the air is continuing to blow. Um, for tongue work, I also love an attack exercise. It's basically a two attack. And we say two, two. And I use a um, G. I start with a G, an open G as, a, um, as an anchor. I do quarter notes. And now we'll just take that up to the G above. So continue to go up chromatically like that. Then I would go to A flat and make that the anchor and take that up an octave and continue on. A would be the anchor and go on. Everybody understand how that works? I think that's a great uh, exercise, not only for your tongue, but also for, to train your uh, lips because your lips have to be in a two position that brings the corners in and makes the uh, lips stronger by doing that exercise. Um, for tongue speed, there are a million different exercises. I love Cal Opperman's chromatic octave study. If you do one octave in chromatics and you start at a very comfortable tempo, say 100. <laughs> and then you do F and then you do F sharp and G, etc. And you gradually speed up your uh, metronome. For you teachers, um, this is something, uh, this is one way that I cheat with my students. We'll start at a very comfortable tempo and I say, okay, now I've got the metronome, I'm going to go up one notch. And if, it, if the player is playing it really well, I go up you know, two notches instead. And then if they do that two notch much better, then I say, oh, I'm going up one more notch and I do two, mo two notches. And so they, they have a mental idea of their top, their top speed. And if we do it this way and they make sure that they do all the fundamental concepts between the octaves, um, then um, very frequently their top speed is faster than they thought it was going to be. So it's an, a nice little surprise. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have any more time, I don't think. But I, I'd like to just suggest my three textbooks, The Embouchure Building for Clarinetists is not only good for embouchure, but for air as well. The Hand and Finger Development for Clarinetists and Articulation Development for Clarinetists. These books are all available from Camco Music. That's spelled C-A-M-C-O Music. Great. Do we have any time left for, I guess we have a minute or two for questions. Great. So ask away. Anybody have any? Um, I had a question. Good. <laughs> okay. Good. So um, I was wondering if you had any tips for embouchure in the altissimo register. Um, I love the E position with the tongue. 
that that high E position is really super good. Um, I, uh, once you've gotten to a note on the high register, I, this is what I hear all the time. Somebody gets to an E, I'm going to make a mistake now. I'll say, okay, that's what happens. And it's because they're concerned so much about the, um, the amateur firmness, although that is important, but they haven't been thought, thinking enough about the air going through the bell through the note. So when you have a, a high note that you're going to be sustaining and you want to have a great control of it, always shift your, your focus to air speed through the bell. And although we think about the embouchure, it's not the first thing on, the, on our minds, the lip pressure, I should say. Um, that was a great question. Um, is there any specific other things in, in the upper register that you have questions with, Alexis? Is it, um, for example, is articulation up there or for articulation in the top, keep the throat open. Super important um, because it's very easy to, if you're not supporting quite well enough, it's very easy to close the throat off and then articulation becomes much harder. So, so keep your air really, really good. Keep your throat open. It'll help all your articulation above a C or C sharp. Yeah, usually when I'm um, playing in the altissimo register, um, I think like um, the note, it wants to come out, but I can't usually, I don't know. It's like tricky. I guess it's a different kind of embouchure that you would use than if you were playing like a G within the staff or. Well, it's not necessarily it's a different kind of embouchure, but it is it maybe a different um, emphasis of certain aspects of the embouchure. One of the things I see, and I don't know if you can see my shoulders, but this is what, if I have a high note to play, I see people doing this, uh, like they're afraid of it. I hope it comes out. Now, when you're doing this with your shoulder, you are nine times out of 10, pulling your lower lip into the tip. So what you have to do is you have to be like fearless and you have to, if anything, go forward, okay? And that's one of the things you do in your, in your warm up. If you have that high note that you're a little bit afraid of, instead of going this way, you go forward for it. And, and um, you, you'll come to um, believe that that will help you. You know, anxiety plays a big role in the upper register. And we have to, we have to be fearless and make sure that we have enough read in the mouth. Uh, try also your right hand thumb up when you're when you, anything above a high C. So I don't want to talk about a different embouchure up there, but actually we make slightly different emphases. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, I would just try that. And if it's uh, involve, um, involving attack up there, I would just do t attack exercises until I'm blue in the face, starting in a high C, C sharp, D, and just do over and over. Do, 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 do. And I get my C sharp, do 20 of them, C, and every one of them forward and, and not, not pulling back and being afraid of it. And since it's a little different, allow yourself to squeak. Allow yourself to make a mistake. We're talking about a little bit of um, um, uh, experimentation here. And I say to my students, okay, this is our laboratory. As long as we don't burn down the building, it doesn't matter. We can do anything we want. So if we're experimenting, don't go by uh, status quo. Go, you know, uh, really go for that experiment. And if you squeak 16 times, you're, you're getting information, right? So really, I, I go for it that way. I saw, sometimes tell my students when le learning something new, if you squeak, you get a plus point because it means that you are trying something different and you're not going back to your status quo all the time. <laughs> okay, anything else? Any other questions? We have a couple questions in the chat. Ben oh, would, good. Like, would like to know what you do for your own warm up every day. Oh, well, um, <laughs> um, I, do, um, I do start with Cal's first notes, the one that I just gave you, the short notes. I do those every day. Um, um, I do Behrman three every day. Um, and um, I, th that includes scales, returning scales, arpeggios, uh, thirds, sixths. Uh, those are great. Um, um, I, I like to do some um, articulation speed every day. And I try to push it to my very top speed because when you're pushing to your top speed, you have to be very efficient. Your tongue has to be very, very light. Your air has to be really, really good. And your embouchure has to be very steady. 
So I make sure I do those every day. Um, and then uh, if I have an, an etude, I love to do a rose etude every day. That takes up, a, you know, much of the practice session until you're doing your solo piece. And there, was there some other question from the uh, chat? Yes, um, Violet is asking, uh, saying, I struggle a lot with throat tension and my throat doesn't feel very relaxed during yawns. Do you have any other suggestions for how to think about or uh, going about keeping the throat open? Good question. Um, the most important aspect of the throat opening um, and being relaxed is the lifting of the soft palate. When you yawn, you usually lift the soft palate, but you also open the bar. And you can't play that way. It's impossible because it will it get a terrible sound, okay? So it, it's too much. So if you can think of the soft palate ra raising and that part of the yawn and not drop too much on the, the bottom of the throat, then it won't, it, it should not be um, uncomfortable. It should feel uh, like you're just taking a nice breath of a beautiful spring air <laughs> um, rather than any kind of uh, overdue. And one little thing about fundamentals that I think teachers have to be very, very aware of is that students, especially very conscientious, good ones will tend to overdo everything. Because they think, if I have to do this much, now if I do that much, it'll be that much better. But sometimes if you do that much, you've done too much. So when you take the yawn, make it a very, very comfortable, easy one, especially lifting the soft palate. Any other questions? Um, Richard is asking, do you have any suggestions to coordinate the tongue and fingers? Oh, well, yeah. I mean... Um, the, I, I do feel that the, the Bonad idea is a great idea. Um, and if he hasn't heard it, he, it's, it's a great one to do. Um, you, um, it, you're tonguing a passage and let's say it's a little arpeggio. Um, I don't know if I can, you can see my fingers. We'll try to make it work that way. Okay. You move the fingers ahead of the tongue. And, um, while the tongue is on the reed between the notes, the finger moves. So if I'm playing C major arpeggio, I'm moving the finger ahead into the next note before I release the tongue off the reed and play the note. Um, I think it's a great thing. I use it all the time. I even use it for, um, quick uh, um, articulation on scale passages. So um, try it. Um, and you can do it that slow and then you can start speeding it up. Now, when you get faster, it doesn't feel like um, finger tongue, finger tongue, finger change tongue. You know, it doesn't feel that the fingers are first. It feels like, I wish I could, um, maybe I can make an illustration. It feels like, Here's the note, and there's the tongue. Can you see that? It's like the long thing is the note, and there's the, uh, I mean, it, yeah, and there's the finger moving ahead. So you're moving ahead, the finger right at the very beginning of the note when you go fast. Does that make sense? Um, when you do it slow, the finger is moving like, you know, five seconds before the note, <laughs> really early. But when you, when you go faster, it's that the finger has moved at the very, very at beginning of the note. And to me, that helps the uh, coordination tremendously. Also, one other thing, when you're doing it, keep your air absolutely steady. Any others? I don't think we have any other uh, questions in, in the chat right now. Okay. Um, and um, 
I just want to say how grateful we are for for this class. This was just amazing. I feel so inspired um, and so many things to uh, to think about and to, to, to chew on. Thank you so much for everything you've shared with us and everything you've done for uh, our, our instrument that we love. Well, thank you, Dr. Cam uh, Campbell. It was a pleasure to be here, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you.